everyone, and welcome to Rick Steves Festival of Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening as we do our first deep dive into a destination, Bella Italia. Please put your travel dreams in the upright and locked position as I have the pleasure to introduce our tour guide for the evening, Rick Steves. Ciao, Rick. Ciao, Lisa. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. It's great to be with all of our travelers. And we are going to Italy, and that just puts me in a good mood right there. So we want to thank you for joining us. As Lisa said, every night this week at this hour, we're going somewhere in Europe. And next Monday, we're having a big party right here in my house, a virtual party. And you're welcome to join us. We've invited our staff. We're going to have a blast. And right now, we're going to go to Italy. So thanks for much, so much time. I'm going to get right into it because there is a lot of ground to cover. Um, this is our schedule for the week. And as you can see here, every night we've got lots going on. And if you are curious about any of these destinations, you are more than welcome to get on board and join us. Now, when we're thinking about our tour program, Italy really kind of dominates. It's our best selling guidebook. It's our best selling tour. We've made more TV shows in Italy than any other place. And tonight we've got all of these different tours that we're going to be talking about. If you look at that, you can see Rome is one of the great cities of Europe. There's a week dedicated just to Rome. There's the heart of Italy. If you got a little bit of time and you want to see a representative sampling of that beautiful peninsula, we got the best of Venice, Florence, and Rome. If you want the biggies in 10 days, if you want to focus in on Tuscany, you can do that. If you want to head down to Sicily, you can do that. If you've done the best of Italy and you want to go south, well, that's a very popular tour. Village Italy goes to all the little tiny spots to get into the culture of the countryside. And of course, the best of Italy tour is just the greatest hits. There's also a My Way tour, which I'll talk about later, but it's a, a tour that comes with the bus, the hotel and the breakfast. It's less expensive, less regimented. It's just you and the, and the guidebook to enjoy yourself as you go. That's a My Way unguided tour. We have the most wonderful gang of guides. This is something that I am just so thankful for when I travel. Uh, we take 30,000 people to Europe every year and they are in the capable hands of this gang. We've got 150 guides that just really are the core of our program as we offer more than a thousand departures at Rick Steves Europe every year. And these are all the itineraries here across Europe. And uh, today, if you look at the most dense um, concentration of tour routes in what we call the spaghetti map, it's Italy, and we're going to zoom in on Italy. Just a quick review, because we've got so many itineraries. I'm not going to talk about specific itineraries. We're just going to talk about the wonders of Italy, and then you can decide what turns you on and find out the itinerary that fits your, your vacation time and your budget and your interests. This is the big tour, and uh, this starts up in the north. You fly into Milan, and you, and you have your first couple of days on Romantic Lake Como. Then you go through the Alps, you got Venice, Florence, the Riviera, Siena, Tuscany, Umbria, Assisi, and you finish with a finale in Rome. Wow. If you want to do everything, but you don't have all that time, the best nine days we can think of is what we call the heart of Italy. And that would be starting in Rome, doing my favorite hill town, Volterra, my favorite bit of the Riviera, that'd be the Cinque Terre, and finishing with Florence, the art capital of Europe. If you've done the best of Italy and you want more, the best of Italy goes as far south as Rome. This picks up from Rome and does a wonderful 13 days in the south, a bunch of offbeat attractions, a bunch of romantic countryside, and it finishes after Rome. It finishes in Naples with Sorrento, the Amalfi Coast, the Isle of Capri, and the Greek ruins at Paestum. If you'd rather get right into one region of Italy, the most popular and romantic region, I would say, is Tuscany. And this is one of our newer itineraries, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And I mentioned the My Way Tour. This is the unguided sort of best 13 days in Italy. And uh, that is a delight if you'd rather be more on your own, but have somebody else do the driving and arrange all the hotels for you. I took my family on the Village Italy Tour uh, because I wanted to go to all the places that, whose names we don't know. Uh, and this is the best of Italian culture without going to the famous cities. And uh, it is a delight for those who are connoisseurs of Italian culture, a very popular tour. Our best selling tour of all is Venice, Florence and Rome of the 40 some tours that we offer. This itinerary is the best selling. Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world and you could not get a more intensive 10 days of sightseeing than this or nine days, three days in Venice, three days in Florence, three days in Rome. Wow, what a great trip. 
You can do that with uh, a Rick Steves tour. You can do it on your own. All of these tours you can use as a springboard for your own independent adventure. That's what our guidebooks are for. Or you can hire us to do the driving and arrange everything. And uh, we'd love to take you around. That's what the guidebooks are for. Everybody who takes the tour gets the appropriate guidebook for where they're going. And if you want to do it without um, without the guide and the bus and just do it on your own, that's what the guidebook's for too. But this is our our passion is to make sure these guidebooks are right up to date. Now, I am blessed with a lot of friends all over Europe, and I, I've got more friends per square mile or square kilometer in Italy, I think, than anywhere else. And I am just uh, so happy to be able to share an event like this with one of our guides, and that is the man you see right there, David Tordy. And David is waking up um, about three o'clock in the morning right now in Italy. And David, thanks for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Ciao, Rick. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Hey, you don't look like you just woke up out of a deep slumber. How are you feeling? <laughs> no, I feel fine. I feel fine. I, I got a good early night's sleep, so I'm all ready to go. <laughs> That's great. Well, you're a mission. Uh, you're a musician, right? So you know the, the, the late hours with your band. Yeah. Hey, David, how long have you been guiding tours with Rick Steves Europe? This is my 10th season. 10th so. season. Nice. Yeah. And you... Um, uh, you live in Orvieto, which we're going to go to, and, and Orvieto is a sort of a classic hill town. Uh, tell us a little bit about your life in Orvieto. What do you do in Orvieto and what, what's it like to live there? It's very cozy. I mean, I live just an hour north of Rome, two hours south of Florence in the middle of the country. I border three regions. So Orvieto is logistically one of the finest stops uh, in Italy because you can reach anywhere you like within an hour or two. Life is very simple, you know, we don't really drive much. We walk all over the place. I own a car and a scooter, but I'm al almost always on my scooter on my feet, so. Nice. Well, and you're very safe because you live on top of a, a volcanic uh, plateau, right? A little yeah. plug. And yeah. it's actually the place where for centuries the Pope would go for refuge when Rome was unsafe. Correct, correct. We've had many Popes residing here. That's also one of the reasons why we have a lot of great art architecture and, and history in town and food. And you've got some great wine nearby. I'm drinking some uh, Vino Nobile di Multipulciano for our little party. What are you drinking in Orvieto right now? I'm drinking some grappa. And, <laughs> uh, you know, grappa is a distillation of grape, uh, grape uh, skins. So yeah, it's if, if this, stronger, if this but... is if this is beef, you're doing you're having beef jerky, I think that's the correct. correct. Oh, baby, grappa. All right. Well, chin chin. Chin chin. Salute, Eric. So, David, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whip through a lot of territory here, and I'm glad you're with me to help out. So um, we're going to carry on here. And uh, thanks again for joining us. But, oh, this is where you and I uh, met just uh, a year ago, I think, in Orvieto. And yeah. I remember uh, it turned out we both had the same scarf, which is kind of nice. Uh, you got your scarf handy? I've got my scarf right here. <laughs> I have it here. All right, we'll, we'll recognize each other when we're when we bump into each other in Italy. Um, so uh, when we are thinking about this uh, tour, uh, Venice is just an amazing place. And uh, Venice is a place that just does not disappoint. It's the best preserved city in so many ways anywhere in Europe. And when you look at this city here, it's shaped like a fish. And you come in by the causeway, you see at the mouth of the fish there in the upper left, and the Grand Canal is like the, 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 the grand intestine, really. Everything comes in at the mouth and everything dumps out there at the bottom. And that's where the Doge's Palace is and uh, St. Mark's uh, Basilica. And uh, we stay right downtown and you can walk everywhere you want to go within 10 or 15 minutes. The amazing thing about Venice is there's no, no new buildings. A lot of tourists, not many people who live there. I think 60,000 people live there. But in the summer, it is packed out. I love looking at uh, paintings from a couple hundred years ago, and you can see from a couple hundred years ago until today, really not a lot of change, just different people. And uh, it's a timeless wonder, Venice. Uh, there's the Doge's Palace, and there's the Doge's Palace today. Uh, this is an interesting photograph for me because this is the reality of tours. And uh, uh, David, we need to be mobile with our bags, don't we? Because there's many cases that I think a good tour cannot get the bus immediately to the hotel that's correct yes especially in places like venice or my town or vieto if you pack too large it's 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 a it's a problem to to walk around so we always recommend packing light and eventually towards the end of the tour if you want to buy an extra bag for yourself that's 
more than better, more than fine, but to travel around pack, pack light. You can always put a box or another bag under the bus and leave it there for your, what we call deep storage. But sure. I'll, I find that a lot of the medieval town centers no longer let um, traffic in and the buses can't get that close to the hotel. And that's great because it's quiet. There's no traffic congestion. You hear the birds in the morning, but you gotta be mobile with your bags. A great thing about the location of our hotels is you can get up before breakfast. You can walk around after dinner. It's safe and it's just the magical time like in Venice when there's no tourist crowds. I like this photograph here, David, because it reminds me when I'm leading a tour, one of my favorite things to do is hold the map for the local guide that we hire to show off his or her town, right? How does that work on our tours? It's incredible because the job of a local guide together with the job of a tour guide like me running the whole tour is the best uh, use of uh, any any tour member's time because we, we, we get to spend two or three hours with an expert, a local expert, yeah. which will know everything better than a tour guide specifically yeah. in details about the area. So what you're doing is just the perfect combination. Supporting the local expert and you or I could give a walk through Venice and it would be perfectly fine, but there's something great about having somebody who lives there, who knows what it's like to, to be there all year long with their neighborhood friends and so on. And that's something that we invest in with our tours because we have so many great local guides as so many and also so many great tour managers like you. Uh, with our tours, we try to maximize the experience. For instance, in Venice, we'll see the mask maker and he'll do his thing for the group as we gather around, fun souvenir. And we also give something that could just be a touristy stop meaning because there's a cultural foundation for these traditions. A lot of people complain about the crowds. I think our guides know how to get away from the crowds. You can walk 10 minutes from all of the tourists and find yourselves in some beautiful, idyllic wonderlands in Venice. And you wonder where are all the tourists? Again, we wanna organize as many uh, lifelong memories as we can. In Venice, you really need a gondola ride. And that's a fun thing to organize for our groups. And we have that experience and it is quite, quite an amazing thing uh, on our tours. All the breakfasts are included and about half the dinners are included. And uh, it's the guide's uh, joy to find a place that fits the group, that makes a memory, and also help the tour get the most out of their free evenings. Because uh, it's nice not to be with the group every night for dinner. Half the nights you're on your own and there's plenty of options for people. I love going to the bars and eating ugly things on toothpicks. In Venice, it's called chiqueta. And David, tell me about this wonderful tradition of Cicchetti in Venice and the Italian um, philosophy of, uh, what do you call it, Ab abiment abimento? Abbinamento. Ab abbinamento. What is abbinamento? Abbinamento in Italian means pairing. When you pair two things or more uh, together and they match just right for your, in this case, for your palate. So two completely distinct flavors together, they make a perfect uh, heavenly flavor. When I, when I was 20 years old, just slumming through Italy on my first time, I discovered prosciutto and cantaloupe or melon, right? Melon and ham, salty ham, sweet fruit, wrapped together. And I didn't know what abbinamento was. I just thought there's something crazy good about this. Well, that's no accident. Italians know how to pair things like that. It's a good marriage. When you have a nice red wine with just the right cheese or meat, I can't put my finger on it, but it really is like the, the whole majesty of the meal comes into focus, doesn't it? Yes, it's like when two people meet, you know, two different people together, they uh -huh. often create something special, you know? Abinamento. <laughs> I never thought yes. about that in the case of a, a two people in a romantic relationship. Well, we'll have that at our meals. Uh, we are right in the center of town. We'll be on campus, our Piazza San Marco and listen to the orchestra. And uh, we'll be there uh, if there's a high tide and a wind and, a, and a, a perfect storm of conditions, we'll have a flood. It happens quite often. And the first place to flood is the main square. Uh, and it's a reminder that we've got some serious work to do when it comes to climate change, that's for sure. Uh, in the lagoon around Venice, you've got plenty of places you can go visit. Most popular is Murano where we can go to see the glassworks, or you can go out to Burano, famous for its lace making. And also for me, just an idyllic pastel village like Venice that really is quite charming. Now, three hours on the bus south of Venice, we get to Florence. 
Florence was the epicenter of that cultural explosion called the Renaissance 500 years ago. And here we see the Arno River with the historic bridges. And we are, we stay probably within five minute walk of the Ponte Vecchio with most of our groups, don't we? Oh yeah, even two. There's one of our hotels is just at the end of Ponte Vecchio in the old town. And, and the nice thing about that is you can drop by your hotel in the middle of the day. You can go out uh, in the in the evening. You can uh, you have that sense of being being anchored in the center of the town. And you know, a five minute walk away, you've got Brunelleschi's dome, the the kicked off the architectural renaissance at the at the beloved Duomo in Florence. Uh, on the main square, we can see uh, remnants of the Medici, and their old offices were called the Uffizi. That's the um, the word in Italian for offices, and today the Uffizi is the greatest collection of Italian Renaissance paintings anywhere, anywhere in the world. And to go in there is great. But David, tell us what it is like to go in there with a great local art historian. It's priceless, honestly, it's priceless. Um, when when we hire local guides, uh, like in this picture, we have Ricardo, a good friend of mine from Florence. He's a Florentine, born and raised, and he's been guiding uh, local guiding tours for like over 35 years. And he's just uh, out, an outstanding use of our time. And by the end of the walk through the museum, in this case, we're inside you feet in this picture, people have a wealth of knowledge uh, beyond imagination. You know, David, I know that the typical tour company just takes the next guide. There's a list of guides and they don't know who it's gonna be and they book them and they get the lowest price and they meet them at the bus and they jump on and do the thing uninspired. You know, Ricardo, I know from all of my Italian guide friends that Ricardo is beloved and we choose him. He loves us and we work together for years. That is an intangible beauty of our tour program that we should be proud of because it really does make a difference. Another thing that we do is we make reservations in advance to avoid the crowds. So many people are spending so many precious hours waiting in line, but we have an appointment and it's complicated in Italy because everybody wants to go to the same place. You can imagine the crowds are going to David, but we go there with, res we got reservations right now for our groups uh, months from now, because we do not want to be standing in line because we want to go and see David and be able to look into the eyes of David and look into the eyes of Renaissance man. And with your guide, you'll know the importance of humanism and the birth of the modern age in Europe that really happened right there in Florence. I know from my own experience what a joy it is to be with groups, with curious Americans who have an attention span and really want to learn and have a transformational tour. And David, as guides, it really is a thrill to have this opportunity to show off the culture, whether it's the high culture or even the sweet gelato culture. There is a lot to teach and a lot to enjoy. This is a very crowded photograph of the courtyard at the Uffizi Gallery in the middle of the day. And I show this just to remind you that in peak season, at peak times, in peak cities like this, it's a mosh pit. But even in the most crowded square, in the most crowded month, if you come back after hours, it is literally all alone and all yours. And for me, David, one of the magic things about Florence is to take a stroll after dinner. It's totally safe. And on the Ponte Vecchio, what might you find? You might find live music. You might find lots of people hanging out and uh, meeting each other for the first time or for the lifetime. It's just it's just incredible. And the way we run our tours is, is perfect because um, we stay in the heart of the action. So people, even if you're jet lagged and you cannot sleep, you just walk down the street in your <laughs> flip flops and you're right here. It's incredible, really. And it feels safe. It feels like a neighborhood. And as you said, there's beautiful music. It's like a concert at 10 o'clock with no crowds at all. You know, yeah. the typical tourists are jamming into the places between 10 and 4, and then they're in their hotel that evening watching TV. Uh, they do everything following the umbrella of their tour guide, and they're parked outside of town. So the only way to get into town is to get onto that bus, pay the extra for the optional tour, and go downtown. Uh, a lot of tour companies want to keep you in the countryside because the hotels are less expensive for groups. Uh, they're modern hotels, so there's no quirkiness and there's no complaints because the elevators work and the air conditioning works. And we stay in funky 400-year-old hotels right downtown that have poisonality, don't we? Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. I, I, would, I wouldn't exchange it for the world. I wouldn't <laughs> change it for the world, really. It's just, uh, it's just magical. You know, you, these, are, these are all items of a traveler that make the group bond, you know, let's get out for a drink, let's get out for a stroll. Absolutely. And when we cross the river, we get into Ultra Arno. 
in the United States, in our history, we always had the wrong side of the tracks. You know, all the decent stuff was on the big side of the tracks. And then if you cross the tracks, that's where you had the, um, the nonconformists, let's put it politely. Well, in Europe, they didn't have the train. They grew up not on train tracks, but they grew up on rivers. So you have the wrong side of the river. You got, you know, um, the south bank of the Thames in London. You got the Latin Quarter in Paris. You got Triana in Sevilla. You got Trastevere, literally across the Tiber River in Rome. And in Florence, you got the Ultra Arno over the Arno River. That's where the action is. Historically, and even today, when you cross that historic bridge and get into the old part of town, David, what kind of characteristic change do you feel about in Florence? Well, you definitely feel um, less crowds because there's less popular highlights on the Oltrarno in this case, over the Arno on the other side, but you get immersed in the culture, in the local uh, people, in the local shops. You see local Florentines talking to local Florentines, going to local Florentine shops, their daily life, you know, it, it's just magical. And we take our groups to a cooking school or a cooking experience in that district, along with all of the artists and the galleries and the artisans we see. Can you tell us a little bit about this, uh, the, the, the food experience, whether it's in Florence or somewhere else on our Italy tours? Yes, anywhere on our Italy tours, on all of our itineraries, where possible, we have cooking experiences. We just don't call them cooking class because we all put our, put our hands in the dough and we learn the, the ancient and, and yet incredible technique of, of making Italian food. Pasta is one of the main dishes, of course, but we get to learn how to make Italian desserts, how to make Italian vegetables, how to make an Italian sofrito, the base of an Italian sauce. We learn all of these things. And then people, when they go back, they they enjoy making it on their own. And then and we eat it. That, we that eat it. We manja. <laughs> because I, I, I did the wonderful experience in, uh, in Florence, in Trastevere, and we made this beautiful lunch and it was delicious. It must have, for me, it was the best meal in town. Uh, I, I felt very proud that we actually made this meal and then ate it. It's a beautiful experience. Yes. Okay. A couple hours south of Florence, we get to the eternal city and that's Rome. And to walk the ancient streets of Rome, this is the Via Sacra, the sacred way from 2000 years ago, uh, the common grounds around the fabled seven hills of Rome, the Roman Forum. Remember, in its heyday, 2,000 years ago, the Pax Romana, the word Rome meant more than just the city. The word Rome was what, how you referred to the civilized world. Everything was Roman or barbarian. If you spoke Greek or Latin, uh, you were in the Roman Empire you, and, and you were in the civilized world. And of course, to the Romans, everything north of the Rhine River was just bar, 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 like a bunch of animals up there, barbarians, hardly human. Uh, that was the Roman Empire at its peak. The, the, they actually called the Mediterranean our lake, Mare Nostrum. And if you look at this map, look at how central Rome is to that empire. What an amazing thing to be able to go to Rome, the capital of that empire, with a good guide. And then you'll understand the Colosseum, 50,000 numbered seats, they can fill it in and empty it as quickly and efficiently as we do our modern stadiums. Uh, uh, when you get to the, uh, the rubble of Rome, I know from my days when I was a tour guide back as when I was in my 20s, there was nothing more rewarding than to sit my group down on a bunch of pieces of a broken column and explain the rise and fall of ancient Rome. And uh, David, now we have local guides like Francesca, that take us around and uh, and and they're really quite amazing, aren't they, David? At at make bringing life to the ruins, big time. Yes, this is uh, Francesca in this picture. Francesca, one of our finest local guides in Italy, I have to say. She specializes in Rome, and again, here you're inside the Colosseum with an expert. Uh, you go through the crowds. Um, you move around, you find your own quiet spot, and then you learn and you soak it all in. Mm -hmm. Thanks to somebody like Francesca. And she'll know how to how to interpret the, the propaganda carved into the marble on an arch like this. And she'll know how to let us imagine what the city was like uh, 2000 years ago when it was the only city in Europe with a million people. Look at that. It's just mind blowing. I mean, you know, it's amazing to me, David, that there are actually ancient doors that have been swinging on the same hinge for nearly 2000 years. Yeah, this is one. This one is in the Roman Forum, has the original uh, key lock the original hinges and still functions probably better than most of the doors in my house. <laughs> That's a, kind of an interesting thing. When you see things malfunctioning in Italy, you kind of go, 
hey, you guys, the Romans did this 2000 years ago. This is the square facing the Pantheon and the Pantheon is the building that gives us really in a feeling, a feeling and an appreciation for the magnificence and the splendor of Rome at its zenith. This was the biggest dome built up until that time. And as far as I understand, uh, David, it remained the biggest dome in Europe for 1200 years. And when Correct. you step in during the middle of the day, it's just mobbed. And this is a good example of the fact that during peak season, if you go to the famous places in the middle of the day, put on your shoulder pads, you know, but I like to go early and I like to go late. And you can't avoid the crowds all the time, David, but tell us a little bit about the art that you employ to help your groups enjoy a place like the Pantheon more like this. This is a peaceful moment in the Pantheon. That's correct. So if you go on the early side or on the late side uh, by yourself, you are always away from the crowds, uh, almost always, of course. But in general, when it's a crowded moment, it's probably better to take a left or right turn and go see something else and then go back to the main highlight. The Pantheon is one of the biggest highlights in Europe, not only in Rome. So, of course, it's crowded. But when you see crowds, it means that the level of what you're looking at is unique. And in this yeah. case, it definitely is unique. So it's worth the hassle. It's worth the extra 10 minute line. Doesn't matter. It's yeah. a one in a lifetime experience. This, this is poured concrete. It's amazing from 1800 years ago. Um, you know, what I think is interesting is when you go to Rome, you can see the ancient foundations of the Renaissance. Uh, the Renaissance is the rebirth to the greatness of classical Rome, you know, and that happened around 1500 in Italy. It started in Italy and spread elsewhere. I love the thought, David, that Michelangelo and the, and the great Renaissance architects, they were not so proud or, or, or bold to say, we're going to do this. They're going to say, let's take two elements of the ancient world. The Basilica Maxentius, for instance, look at how big this uh, ruins of a basilica is, and the Pantheon, and let's put them together. We'll put the dome of the Pantheon on top of the Basilica Maxentius, and we can make a big church and call it St. Peter's. But that is two ancient elements put together. Does that make sense to you, David, as a guide? That's exactly correct. The Renaissance is the rebirth of our ancient classic knowledge. So on top of that, uh, with newer technology 500 years ago, we were able to put several elements together and, and make it what we call today Italian and European Renaissance. I love it. And when you're going to tell people all about that, you're going to be a good guide like we see right here and put your people in the shade, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, especially if it's June or July, yes. But but yeah, yeah it, could be, it could be warm, but the, in Rome, there's always a nice breeze, the so-called Ponentino. Oh, the Ponentino. I love yeah. that. Oh, baby. Yeah. There's a, oh, geez. Um, and here, I just love this shot because it does show a guy that is compassionately keeping his group in the shade, in the shade of an, of a, of an Egyptian obelisk that's twice as old as the Roman Empire that was moved there from Egypt. And that's the obelisk that uh, St. Peter saw on the day he was martyred 2000 years ago. And then they took his body up to the and buried it on the humble uh, on the hill there that you see the church now and there's a little Vatican cemetery. And then 300 years later, uh, the Emperor Constantine became a Christian and bam, you can worship uh, in the daylight there and they built a big church. And for all for, for centuries now, this has been the, the headquarters of a billion Roman Catholic Christians. And to go there and to understand the history and the importance of this and Michelangelo's beautiful dome and the guy with the bushy beard and the big key has got to be Peter. And he's buried in the middle of that church and up there in the dome, you see six foot tall letters with that gold leaf mosaic and it says in latin to s petrus you are peter and upon this rock i will build my church it is so important when we go there to understand it in its terms uh, i went in there for years as an angry protestant just pissed off and then i realized no become a roman catholic as you go in see it on its terms see it in its context understand what it was meant to be why was it built why did they pay for it and then you go in there and go wow this is quite an accomplishment 500 years ago to step into the greatest church in christendom and to gaze up at that dome and to think that was the design of michelangelo and then in the back of the church you've got the incredible pieta another statue by that same artist michelangelo i do want to remind anybody who's thinking of our tours i, I want to be straight with you 
This year is the first year that tour companies are generally not going to the Vatican Museum. It's this is the Vatican Museum. It's too crowded. The Vatican doesn't want to let in big groups and it is more practical to go as individuals. So this year we're giving people free time in the afternoon who want to go to the Vatican. You need to book it like so many important sites these days after COVID. You have to book it in advance, but it's pretty straightforward. You just got to do your due diligence as an independent independent traveler and make your reservation buy the ticket and be there and enjoy the Vatican Museum. And what we're relying on is the audio tours that we've produced. Uh, Rick Steves Audio Europe, you'll be using that occasionally on your tour. There's 60 free tours on our app. And one of those does cover the Vatican Museum. But uh, you will not be able to see your way to the next uh, stage of the Vatican Museum these days. Uh, it is so crowded. And if you want to see the Sistine Chapel, you can do it. But I just want to remind you this year, we won't be able to do that with our groups. At night, Rome is just sparkling and it's sparkling with floodlit treasures. And that's something we love to do. I just love to be on the Via del Corso, David, and uh, be there when they shut down the traffic and everybody's out strutting their stuff. And all over Italy, you live in a small town, Orvieto, and two hours south of you is the biggest city uh, around Rome. And it's the same thing, isn't it? Tell us about the Passeggiata. It's the same thing all over the place. Whether you live in a hundred, a hundred people village or in a four million <laughs> city, uh, people city like Rome, Italians yeah. love their stroll. Passeggiata is the stroll, is the slow walk with no destination. You don't have to go anywhere. You just yeah. come downstairs, dress as much you know as you like, and just take a stroll, meet your friends, your family, or nobody, uh, and maybe I have love a gelato. Yeah. I love it. You can, uh, you know, if, if you like, you know, that's the time when you make the scene, isn't it? Let's say you got, let's say you got a new scarf and you really are proud of your scarf and mm -hmm. you want to put it on and maybe you're going to find a neighbor that's wearing the same scarf and then you go, ciao, come va? Molto bene, grazie. Tu? Uh, yeah, good. I'm drinking some great wine here. Do you know the uh, Cantucci? We've been uh, visiting the uh, cantina. Certo. I'm having okay. cafe corretto eh, right now. Ah, okay. <laughs> a little espresso with a, with a shot of grappa inside. Oh, tell me more about that. That's called Cafe Corretto? Cafe Corretto, yeah. My grandfather taught me the name because in Italian, Cafe Corretto is coffee, espresso, uh, with a splash of, gra of grappa, if you want the harsh flavor, or Sambuca, which is an, like an anise liqueur, ah, sweet liqueur. Um, nice. Corretto because for the old generations, Coffee without alcohol was considered wrong, so they incorrect. corrected it with, with <laughs> alcohol. Yes. So, correcto is correct, right? Correct. Correct how coffee. Do you, how, how do you say incorrect? Uh, non corretto. Or <laughs> non corretto. Sbagliato. So, cafe non corretto. I have a, I have a <laughs> cafe non corretto every morning. Yes. So, hey, I know you've got your um, coffee maker there because you're a connoisseur of um, a traditional coffee. Can you give us a little tour of your coffee maker? Of course. I just used it 10 minutes before we we, we started. We, we, sh we should remind people, David, it is six o'clock here in Seattle. But for you, it's about three o'clock in the morning. You've gotten up for this party. That's correct. So I'm having my coffee to wake me up. But then I have my grappa to put me back to sleep for another <laughs> nap. So I usually make coffee the old way uh, before the invention of espresso machine, the one that you all mm, might have seen at an Italian cafe bar. Uh, we have the mocha. Mocha was invented in the 30s by Mr. Bialetti, and it's a machine made of three pieces. I'll show you in a second. So there's the head, there's the filter, little filter, and mm -hmm. then the uh, chamber. So you fill this with water to the knob, and then you put the filter in, and you fill the filter with coffee powder, ground specifically for mocha, different okay. consistency. And then you have the most important part, which is the, the upper chamber. So yeah. you screw it tight and like this, you put it on the stove, medium low fire, low fire is better. And then the percolation happens. So the pressure of the water goes through the filter with the powder and mm. it fills the upper chamber. And then you stir the upper chamber and you pour it in your Italian tazzina, which is also the name of my cat. And, <laughs> and then you drink your coffee and then you rinse this and you put, don't wash it with soap. Just rinse it, no washing okay. with soap. There you go. Thank you. This is the kind of fun that I love when I'm in anywhere in Europe with friends that know what's going on in that culture. Thank you for that little insight. That was that was really, really nice. And uh, 
I hope you're enjoying your cafe correcto. I hope you're having. I a am. Good I am. All right. Well, let's carry on with our. This is uh, this is the uh, Campo di Fiore here, and uh, it's just one example of the neighborhood squares that we can see and we like to lace together with a nice walk through the evening. Uh, a five minute walk away is uh, Piazza Navona and famous for its fountains by Bernini. And then a 10 minute walk from there, we get to the Trevi Fountain, which is famous for romantics to toss a coin in to make sure they can go back. Hey, I wanna review with you what's included in these tours. When you're thinking about a Rick Steves tour, uh, first of all, all the sightseeing is included, which is really important to me. Um, uh, we have small groups, 24 to 28 people, rather than 50 people on a 50 seat bus, we have uh, about uh, two seats per, per person. Uh, you've got a Rick Steves guide and a local guide. Uh, and this is very important because there is a philosophy of travel that we all have in common. Um, we took 30,000 people on our tours last year and half of them were return travelers and they were coming back because they had a good experience with their last guide and they're expecting the same quality of an experience with the next guide. And that's what we're very proud of. Our accommodations are not, you know, four star fancy resort hotels. They're two or three star hotels located in the center of town. They're generally not chains. They're generally one off family run hotels uh, in, in a beautiful part of town. They're safe, they're friendly, uh, they're quiet, and they work just great for us. All your breakfasts, about half your dinners are included and all the tips are included. Something really fundamental, David, about the way we do our tours is the fact that we've made all our money up front. We pay our guides up front, pay the driver up front, the tipping's all included, all the sightseeing's included. There's no shopping for kickbacks. And you know, because you're a professional guide, if you wanted to work for another company, you would get a smaller wage and an in, in encouragement to make money with tips and kickbacks on shopping and selling sightseeing optional tours, right? That's correct. That's also one of the many reasons why I'm really happy to guide uh, for Rick Steves Europe because the, the 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 quality of the tours, but also the philosophy mainly. Mm -hmm. The philosophy is what really triggers um, tour guides and, and and tour members and travelers to join these tours. We we do no kickbacks. We have no interest whatsoever where people go and shop. If they need some advice, of course we're there to provide advice, mm -hmm. personal yeah. advice, like another person. But no no interest in that. But I'm so glad that you guys and me, we've made our money up front. We've advertised it honestly. It might cost a few more bucks from the start, but when the dust settles, your tour costs probably less than the other kind of tours and your guide is on your side from the beginning rather than keeping you in the dark in order to sell you things and make more money after you're already on board. Yes, that's correct. And that also works for the meals, you know, when we decide to, even when we decide to have an optional meal, uh outside of the the tour schedule yeah. and everybody wants to come you know i'm happy to say okay a friend of mine has a restaurant 10 blocks away do you want to walk let's go and then yeah. everybody pays their own fee and and we all leave and we enjoy so. well i'm so thankful that you guys enjoy teaching rather than selling uh, options and taking people shopping for kickbacks because you don't need to and that's why i started this tour company 30 or 40 years ago hey um we want to remind people that next monday we're having a big party right here in my house a virtual party and you are virtually invited to come <laughs> um, and uh, my staff is actually going to be here and it's just a blast and we're going to give away two tours next month um Monday and anybody who attends um, any of these um, uh, uh, evening events this week uh, can fill out the form and get their name in the list and the odds are not that bad and you might win yourself a uh, 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 tour to any of the, the great cities that we do in Europe. Also, I want to remind you that uh, if you book during this festival time until February 5th and you use the promo code, you'll save $100 per seat on the tour. Last year, we did this festival over 22 days. Every night there was an event like this. And I wanna stress that because this year we're getting a little lazy. We're just doing it for eight nights in a row. And that means David and I are covering what we covered in four hours last year in one hour. The point is, if you want more information on what David and I are talking about, we've got all of this archived, it's all recorded. It'll feel like you're just with us like you are right now live. And if you look here, you see on uh, Tuesday, January 10th, uh, we covered Venice, Florence and Rome in a whole hour. Uh, on January 15th, uh, David joined me and we went to the Italy countryside. 
Uh, and then on the 21st, we went to Sicily. We won't even be covering Sicily this week. So there's an hour on Sicily there. And then on the 29th, I did a sort of a, a extra, just the joy of Italy evening, also with David Tordy. Uh, the point is there's four hours of information on our tours in Italy right there. If you are interested in any of that, if you go to our website at ricksteves.com, go into the tour section, and when you drill in there and you find the tour and you look, okay, this is the Heart of Italy tour, you will then be able to click and watch uh, the show here of your choice. I hope that you can take advantage of that. And I also want to remind you that we've made over 100 episodes of Europe and 18 of those are in Italy. So we've got 18 half hours in Italy. If somebody asks me, what should I do in Sicily? Well, I would say you should watch the two half hour shows, the one hour that I made about Sicily after taking our Sicily tour. And it's essentially the tour uh, uh, with two TV shows from public television. And there's a lot of good information there. All of these shows are available for free at the PBS app or on our website. Uh, I also want to remind you today we're having a, a blowout on the first book that I ever wrote. This is the 39th edition. This is Europe through the back door. And I don't get a chance to talk about the basic skills of European travel, but this is the book that I've written and updated with my staff every year for the last 39 years. And uh, it retails for $27, just as long as supply lasts. I think it'll only be tonight. We won't be advertising this tomorrow. But if you want to get uh, this book at that special price, it is $10. All right. Um, now, David, we're going to go off into the countryside. <clears throat> and we're going to start with the Cinque Terre. And we are, I'm sorry, we're just, it's so much fun to be sharing all this and especially to have you here, David, we're going to have to crank it up because we have, to, we have another half an hour in this evening. And the Cinque Terre, I've seen a lot of the Riviera. This is my favorite part of the Riviera. One town is a resort, Monterozzo. We either sleep in Monterozzo or Levanto, and that's the beautiful um, place where you might want to lay on the beach. And then the four, the five villages are just gorgeous. It's a national park. Nobody can change any of their buildings. And it's a delightful place. As guides, we like to orient people. And then they basically have a whole day free for the Riviera. Wonderful food, fresh seafood, uh, and something that is very special in Liguria. Tell us about pesto, David. Uh, pesto. Pesto, Italian pesto was invented in the Italian Riviera, in the Cinque Terre and Genoa area. And it's uh, originally it was not for pasta. It was a uh, spread meant for focaccia, for bread, for sailors, you know, going away for several days so you could safely store it and preserve the food. Um, it, it's it's made with local basil, which is small, uh, light green color leaf uh, basil uh -huh. and pine nuts, parmigiano and pecorino cheese oh. and olive oil. I love it. And they even have their own pasta, a special pasta that's kind of designed for the pesto, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. There's a few styles of pasta. Yeah. These are trofie, trofie uh, with pesto. I yeah. love being in Italy with somebody like David who can explain to me all the history of this food that I'm enjoying because it's tasty, but it also has a history. And yeah. can you imagine having an evening in a town like Vernazza? Can you imagine the next morning hopping on the boat and going to the next town and looking at the five towns of the Riviera from the water? Can you imagine hiking from town to town to town? That's what our groups love to do. That is the Italian Riviera. And I look at that. I just can't get enough of it. And you'll have all sorts of chance to meet the locals and have your own adventure. I met this, uh, this uh, um, I, I think he was a friar or a, a, a brother, a, a monk, at a church outside of Monterozzo. And he said, would you like to come into the abbey and try my homemade limoncello? I said, sure. I don't know if you know this guy, David, but we had the greatest time together. I got a little tipsy with my with my uh, monk friend here in the Cinque Terre, and it was a lifelong memory and just a wonderful, wonderful uh, man who shared with me his whole world. Um, nearby is Pisa, and uh, of course we like to stop by Pisa because you got to see the Leaning Tower, and uh, we can check that out. And then up in the north are the lakes of Italy. I love the lakes and my, you know, what I do for a living is visit all the lakes and figure out which one I think is best for my readers. And, um, you know, it's not a definitive thing, but for me, Lake Como, Lago di Como is far and away the best lake for the kind of traveler I am. Uh, lake Como is nicknamed Luna di Miele. Is that the word for honeymoon, David? Yes, Luna di Miele, yes. Luna di Miele. This is honeymoon country. And uh, you can take these romantic uh, steamers up and down the lake. You can go to the lovely little resort town of Bellagio. And we like to stay in Varena. 
just a 10 minute ferry ride from Bellagio and talk about Luna de Mille country. It is just exquisite. I, this is, if I ever need to convalesce in Europe, this is where I like to go to convalesce. Up into the mountains, that is the Dolomite, the Dolomites. And uh, this is the limestone rugged mountains that are the Italian part of the Alps. And we have a, a, a good chance uh, to go to the highest alpine meadow in Europe. This is called the Alpi di Susi. And it's just a wonderland to explore and hike and walk, or maybe just pull up a chair and have a beer and, and pretend you're at the beach. Uh, my favorite hill town is Volterra. And we stay at Volterra in several of our itineraries. Uh, Volterra is kind of a dark, a little bit windy and foreboding, medieval feeling town. And to go there is a chance to really get into the hill town culture of Italy. And our friend Annie lives there. And Annie is married to Francesco. Uh, what is what is his name again? Francesco. That's Francesco. right, Fran Francesco. And Francesco is like a sommelier, right? He knows his wine. Oh yeah, he's also my roommate. When I come visit you in Edmonds, he's my roommate. There I you have a, go. He has a roommate. <laughs> you got a good roommate, and so does Annie here, who's an American who has uh, married into the culture. But Annie is uh, a, an example of one of our local guides, and she meets our groups, and she has a wonderful expat view of things. She's a uh, she's now a local. Uh, they're raising their kids there, and her husband's wonderful. And it's the kind of connections we have where you can actually come to a town like this and get a intimate understanding of the Etruscans. That is an Etruscan arch. That's from 500 BC. It's amazing. And there you'll find remnants of that fascinating and mysterious civilization that was there before Rome. Also in Volterra, you can see the alabaster workshops, and that makes for a very nice souvenir. Another great stop in the central part of Italy is Assisi. This is the town of St. Francis, and we can wander through Assisi and get close to the whole story of St. Francis and visit the Basilica of St. Francis and see where his tomb is. And it's just, to me, an inspiration. It, Assisi is one of those places, uh, David, that says it's a, a thin place, right? It has a thin atmosphere. There's something, I don't know, what do you think? There's something spiritual about uh, Assisi. Yes, it's spiritual, it's historical, it's magical. You have everything you, you need in Assisi. Great food, incredible art, the art of Giotto, Simone Martini, Piero della Francesca, you've got hundreds of amazing uh, medieval and Renaissance artists, the architecture, St. Francis, and everything speaks about St. Francis and St. Clair. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Also nearby is Siena. And Siena was a very important part of Italy back before Italy was united. We got to remember there was no Italy before 1870. It was a bunch of small uh, Italian speaking states that dreamed of making one united Italian speaking country, which only happened after the Risorgimento, the Italian unification movement around 1870. But back in the middle, middle, medieval time, it was a bunch of little countries. Today, you look at the map and you can see San Marino uh, as a little remnant of those feudal times, the little independent of country of San Marino buried in the middle of Italy. But Siena was the proud capital of its own city state. And here you see on the main square, not a proud church spire, but a proud bell tower of a city hall reminding you that this was the age of humanism, where people were taking the reins into their hands and they wanted to be an independent republic. Of course, they had a nice church, but on that main square, what you've got is the city hall. And I love to buy a spritz and just enjoy some little munchies and watch the world go by, uh, observing the parade of life in a place like Siena. Uh, the Campo, my favorite square in all of Italy. Boy, if you come there on a festival day, it's crowded. And that festival day might be having something to do with the Palio, uh, the most crazy horse race you'll ever get a chance to see. I do want to mention that we do not build our tours around festivals. Uh, but David, if there is a festival going on, and we know about it, we can try to work it into our plans, can't we? Yes, that's when a tour guide and a local guide are useful, you know, also because we might know a guy who knows a guy who knows a lady, they can find you the tickets. But in general, when it's a special event, we all try to enjoy. I was in Sicily in December running a Sicily tour for Rick Steves Europe, and we happened to be at um, St. Agatha in, uh, sorry, St. Lucy in Syracuse, and uh, and it was just incredible. And all of my group and myself, we all went for the procession and the parade oh. and the music and the food. And it was just a, 
an incredible experience. And, and David, if you didn't have a guide, you might not even know what was happening. It could be five miles away. And exactly. that's what I, I love. You have these festivals in the countryside. What are they called? Sab, Sagra, Sabra, something like that? Sagra. Sagra are food festivals, yes. Every town in Italy has uh, one or more sagras dedicated to one specialty, local specialty. In my area, we have porcini mushroom sagra, uh, wild boar meat Arti sagra. Artichokes. Sorry? Have you had artichokes. Artichokes, see, sí. Sagra dei Carciofi, Artichokes Sagra, a couple of towns over. Yeah, yeah, of course. I went to that one once, and I swear it was the best. Uh, I still have vivid memories of the beautiful tasting artichokes that we had during that festival. There's a yeah. lot of festivals in these towns like Siena. Oh, man. Uh, these little hill towns to me are so romantic. This is Civita. It's about 10 miles away from where David lives. This is David's hometown, um, Orvieto. And uh, we just love Orvieto. And last year, I was um, leading a group of guides around in the winter. Uh, David, every winter, you know, we I, I become the tour guide and I have 25 professional guides that want to work for us. And they're all good guides. They're pros, but they need to know the philosophy of a Rick Steves tour. So they get to be tourists on a Rick Steves bus, along with some other people from our tour operations department. And we have a wonderful time letting them understand the philosophy of a Rick Steves tour and uh, what was it like for you, David? Because we dropped by your hometown and you showed us around for a morning in your beautiful church. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun and it was great to meet some future new colleagues. And, uh, and it was a great privilege for me to show them and you around my hometown. This is where I had my first communion, baptism, uh, confirmation. That's where my parents got married. This is the Duomo Cathedral of Orvieto. Uh -oh. So to me, this is more than a church. It's it's part of my heart, you know? Yeah, and I'll never forget the joy and the pride and the expertise that you shared when you took me and 25, you know, guides in training around. And now many of these guides, um, you know, they made the cut and they are colleagues of yours and they're leading our groups around this year. We have 1,200 departures every year. That's a you know, 150 guides. There's a lot of organizing and a lot of talent in that school. I love to walk across your town, pick up maps at the tourist office. I orient them. And you know this, Bluff, it's on the far side of town where very few tourists go. And then I tell the group, okay, you got an hour and a half of free time. I'll see you back at the cathedral and we'll get on the bus and carry on. And they go, really? We're all alone now in the town? You got a map? You've had your orientation walk? I'll see you back at the Duomo. <laughs> It's yes. beautiful. It is beautiful. Hey, um, let's talk about Tuscany, um, uh, sure. David, because this is a new tour of ours. And um, I just think there's a huge demand for Tuscany. And uh, people really, uh, you know, of course, it's Tuscany is named after the Etruscans. And that was the empire there north of Rome, you know, 500 years before Christ. And you've got a lot of um, Etruscan artifacts in Tuscany that really are mysterious and amazing. This is one of our local guides, Roberto Becchi, looking at the uh, sarcophagi. But uh, what what is Tuscany to you? Like, I'm just going to show the slides here, and I'll let you just talk about Tuscany, and I'll move the slides whenever I feel like it, okay? So tell sure. us. So uh, I'm very glad that we started running this tour in 2022. And um, and I'm one of the guys that run the tour. I've run it many times, and it's an incredible mix of one of the largest regions of Italy. But not only size-wise, also uh, the the amount of things, attractions of, of lo locations that the region of Tuscany has to offer is really incredible. So we had to make a special selection. This is Valdorcia, one of the iconic landscapes of Tuscany. If you've watched the movie The Gladiator with Russell Crowe, some some sections of the movies were filmed. The movie were filmed in Valdorcia. Valdorcia is an incredible rolling hills system of Tuscany. We get to meet local people, like in this case Luciano, which makes his Vinsanto, his holy wine, a special kind of wine that in Tuscany they make to to drink and with your Cantucci. I cookie. love uh, Vinsanto. It's a beautiful Funky. thing. Yeah. dessert dessert wine, and I love to have it with a with a family that actually makes it. Yeah, Tuscany is all about family, small communities, and families. I live five minutes away from Tuscany. I live between three regions, so part of Tuscany is also part of me. And uh, and and that's that tour. But in general, exploring Tuscany, Tuscany has Florence, uh, um, uh, Pisa, um, San Gimignano, many destinations, but has much more to offer. Yes. That's why we decided to run this tour. And it's uh, a lot of tasty pigs. 
Oh yes, tasty pigs, great vegetables for those who are um, who, who prefer vegetarian. Like in this case, you have a beautiful caprese salad with fresh mm -hmm. tomato, fresh mozzarella, and basil. In the back, uh, on the right, you see prosciutto. Actually, that's spalla. That's the shoulder of the pork and capocollo. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tuscan is famous in the world for their cold cuts. The David, Italian cold cuts. Excuse me, David. You come to the United States occasionally, and uh, you have to eat tomatoes here. Does it make you homesick? <laughs> uh yeah sometimes yes i have to say because tomatoes here are very very tasty very flavorful and in tuscany we have amazing quality tomatoes you are polite i've never if you've only had american tomatoes i i, I don't think you know what you're missing when you go to italy yeah. when, you, when you go to greece there's something about the um the richness of the flavor uh it's, pienza is a great yeah. example of a, a very uh once upon a time important town isn't it Definitely, P town uh, town of origin of Pope Pius II, but also the town that's also that's famous for the spectacular pecorino cheese mm. of Pienza. Mm. So again, in Italy, in towns like Pienza, in Tuscany, in everywhere in Italy you go, you have a mix of everything in one small place. Family, uh, the stroll, making new friends, great food, great locations, incredible art and history and the architecture. And I honestly don't see what I would need more than that, uh, and, you know. And edible souvenirs. Correct. Oh, Correct. Souvenirs. Yeah. Yeah. oh and drinkable souvenirs. <laughs> Brunello de Montalcino, that's the finest wine. And uh, we'll visit a vineyard. Wonderful. Oh, yeah, we visit vineyard. a producer, a producer of Brunello di Montalcino, the, the, the cellar, the winery. We have lunch there. And we do a, twist, a tasting of several of that Brunello and Rosso di Montalcino wine. Oh. And again, I, when I, you I, taste I, these kinds of wines, it's not easy to go back to. You know, David, I'm having I'm having wine from the same region right here, Montepulciano, Vino yeah. Nobile di Montepulciano. Yeah, yeah. Tuscany is the region in Italy that, that has the the highest number of DOC and DOCG wines, which are protected recipe wines. You know, special recipe wines. And uh, Brunello di Montalcino, uh, Nobile di Montepulciano, Vernaccia di San Gimignano, and so on, blah, blah, blah. I can stay here forever. There are, <laughs> many of them come from Tuscany, and Brunello is in the top five red wines in the world. Wow. And we get to try them, and we get to try that abbinamento, the, the good marriage between that and, uh, and the local produce. And there's that zero kilometer concept, uh, sort of Italian slow food movement, where it's wonderful to have everything from the same community, the wine, yeah. the, the prosciutto, prusciet, the and the cheese and the bread. It's all good, isn't it? Mm. Correct. And that's also why, going back to the tomatoes, uh, that's why the tomatoes taste great, because they come from the very farm that also produces the wine. And you can get wine really cheap. This is just about a mile away from where you live. Tell us what this yes. is. This is a wine station. It's a social co-op winery where people go with their empty jugs or, or, or containers, um, and like you're doing in the picture. And like a gas station, you pick up the pump you, you know, and, and you insert it in your container and you fill the tank except that you fill it with local wine. And the price is like 150, nowadays it's 150, 160 a liter, which is so more than a- A dollar and a half a, for a quart. And it's good, and it's, you know, it's, it's decent wine. Of course, uh, yeah. you know, you've got that rich culture. We've got artisans that are proudly doing their thing. This is Cesare in uh, Mont Montalcino or Montepulciano? I, I Montepulciano. Montepulciano. And Cesare, he leaves his door open. He loves to show off. He's such a beautiful character. And his wife will sell you whatever he's made. Uh, there's so much fun to be had. Uh, Petigliano, a beautiful town that we stay in, call home. Uh, and then, yes, exactly. And then what's going on here, David? Here we're doing a truffle hunt with my good friend Bruno, uh, the man with the stick. He's the truffle hunter with his dog, uh, one of his dogs. And um, and that's what we just found, you know, in this in this. Picture. That's, a, that's worth a lot of money, isn't it? This is like a like kind of a relative of, of a mushroom, but it's underground and the dog can sniff it out. Correct. Correct. That's why you need dogs. And um, and it lives underground in lack of oxygen. It expands. It's like a spore, like mm -hmm. for mushrooms, except that it grows underground like a potato. It's it's a it's a fungus growing underground and it's a truffle. And then you shave it fresh. Wow. on the on the food this is shaved on on buffalo buffalo mozzarella cheese 
next to prosciutto that's a great abbinamento right? i was that's just gonna great... say i don't know but that looks like that's got abbinamento written all over it doesn't yeah. it uh, of course. Look, fresh look olive like... oil oh baby olive oil pr um, uh, the, the ham and the um, uh, burrata burrata is something yeah. that takes mozzarella to special heights yes correct and then you got more artifact art artisans and, and local culture you can go to daruta and 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 uh, visit this man yeah, this is this is Mauro, one of my friends in Deruta at the Gialetti Far factory, and this is one of the painters. They have a painting room with about fifteen professional painters, and this is the style of ceramic that they produce, the Deruta style, which is famous all over the world, and there is a reason why uh, mm -hmm. the technique is incredible. And since in, since the Roman times, Deruta has been producing incredible ceramics. In this picture, instead, you have the Maremma, the wild west of Tuscany. We call it the cowboy country of Tuscany because even though they're not cowboys, the, the, they're a butteri, the Tuscan cowboys. They uh, they make, they manage this incredible variety of cattle. We get to experience that on the Tuscany tour. We go through this ancient 100-year-old uh, uh, olive grove and then we have again an amazing meal tasting all local produce. Um, you know, I got to say, David, you are selling me on my own tour. I'm, I want to sign up. <laughs> I want to yeah. sign up on this tour. And, and one thing I love, I mean, with all respect to vegetarians, of course, but I love the Chianina beef, you know. And this is, when you say Chianti, we know the Chianti wine, which is it used to be famous table wine. Now it's quite good wine. And you've got the Chianina beef, which that means uh, Chianti beef, basically, doesn't it? Yes, Canina is a variety of ca of, uh, of of cattle that uh, lives thrives living in in the area of uh, Val di Chiana, the valley of River Chiana, which then connects into the Chianti area, and uh, and that's the kind of meat that kind of of cow, a cow that's butchered to make the famous the famous Florentine steak, which is a T-bone Florentine steak, yeah. and many other kinds of Canina steaks. This is the example. I love going into a steakhouse in Montepulciano or Montalcino or in Tuscany and and uh, they bring you over a, a piece of uh, meat, red meat, and uh, you don't tell them how you want it. There's only one way, seven minutes on each side, 15 minutes later, you got yourself a beautiful, beautiful steak. And shortly after that, that steak is history. Oh, what an experience uh, with the red wine, abinamento. Exactly, exactly. And you got to pick up the bone. Huh? If you don't pick up the bone, the, the cook gets offended. You got to crack <laughs> the bone and clean it up. Unfortunately, that's tradition oh, here. I got to get back. I got to get back. And then if you need a little detox after all that red meat, there's plenty of um, um, antipasto buffets where you can put yourself to a nice plate together. And that'll be history as well. Lots of fun to be had there. Um, also, uh, when you go south of Rome, uh, we have uh, Sicily. Sicily is a great tour. You can see the map there. We don't have time to cover it tonight, but I do want to remind um, our, our travelers that are viewing that uh, we're really hot on Sicily lately. This is one of our best-selling guidebooks, our Sicily book. We have two TV shows about Sicily that explain what the program is like. I took the tour myself. It was so good. I love our Sicilian guides. And you can go back uh, in the archives and watch last year's hour on Sicily if you would like. But we've got a little time left with David, and we're going to go now south of Rome on the South Italy tour, which really complicate, com complicates, it complements the uh, rest of the tours that we've talked about. Naples is a couple hours south of Rome, and Naples to me is sort of an urban jungle. Can you explain to us, uh, David, about Basso living? See, so Naples, um, for those who see it for the first time, is what's the closest to modern Europe and ancient Europe in one place. And you leave, you leave, you leave the city in the streets. The Neapolitans live outdoors. They do everything together outdoors. They're, the rules are different, and it feels some 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 places it feels like a, an African uh, kashba. Some other places it feels like a Spanish ancient city some other place if it's like a european city it's all in the same place and it's, uh, all, the in the street. Street. it's all in the street yeah it's all in the low streets in the in the bus so yeah in the incredible food products i mean i'm not gonna even go there naples oh. has among the best flavors i've ever tasted in the world 
oh, uh, I have to the, say. The markets are great. I love going to a market in, in Naples and, and, and buying bread from the person who baked it and to hear the song of the merchants and uh, to look up, up above and, and you see there's uh, pensioners living right there on the fourth floor that can't even hardly climb down the stairs anymore and they're lowering baskets on ropes to pick up their fruit and vegetables and it's just a community that looks after itself and takes care of itself and of course this is the birthplace of pizza you're going to get some yeah. great pizza oh, in, yeah. in venice and there's a, a look south from naples at mount vesuvius and that looks like a big mountain but you know two thousand years ago it was not shaped that way it was shaped that way according to the roman paintings Yes. There we have a there we have a, a, a painting of Mount Vesuvius before it erupted in 79 AD, and then it erupted, and the lava flowed down that slope and buried Pompeii. And today, with our groups, we can walk through uh, an excavated ancient Roman city, can't we? Exactly, and that's again the best use of our time. We spend like three three and a half hours in Pompeii with a special local guide, Gaetano, and mm -hmm. again. That's the best use of our time, and it's magical to walk the street. I love of it. And then, just a half an hour south of Pompeii, we got Sorrento, and this I think of as Lemoncelloville. You know, uh, uh -huh. it's just a delightful resort. After the gritty reality, the urban intensity of Naples, you come here, and it's holiday time. And from there, in an hour, you are at the at the romantic, enchanted island of Capri. Or you can head south for the Amalfi Coast and check out Positano. There is so much to do. And then just beyond that are the ancient Greek ruins of Paestum. And you can do that all with Sorrento as your home base. David, I love to think that one of these people could be one of our tour members. Probably, because we <laughs> mingle with the locals. <laughs> That's that's the goal, and uh, and we want to be right there where the action is. Uh, so again, we've uh, kind of skipped uh, through a lot of Italy right now. And David, what I'd like to do to finish things off is, if you could, talking about as fast as you know I like to talk, walk us through each of these itineraries, and I'll just go through each of the itineraries, but introduce them to you because um, you know these itineraries intimately. Sure. So your this one is the best of Italy. It's the longest tour we have in Italy, 17 days. It does an incredible selection of center and northern Italy. And it starts in uh, the area of Milan, Lake Como, and then we come, we find our way south, touching many different regions of Italy. Tours like this give you an incredible taste of different cultures within Italy. Italy is one of the most diverse, one of the one of the most diverse countries in the world, definitely in Europe, culture-wise. And uh, this tour gives you an incredible yeah. extend. And uh, what I like about this, David, is if you look at those number two, 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 we do not like one night stops if possible. These are two night stops. So you have a day of travel and then you have two nights and an entire day to get used to a place. And it lets you feel rooted, even though it's a fast itinerary. But I cannot imagine a smarter, more diverse and uh, variety filled uh, uh, and an intimate look at the culture. Uh, big towns, small towns, hill towns, Riviera towns, mountains, lakes, than you could get anywhere else, Italy in 17 days. If you only have nine days. Exactly. Heart of Italy is a great uh, uh, shorter version of, of the Best of Italy tour, and it touches four of my favorite areas. I love Rome. Of course, I live an hour north of Rome, but we begin uh, we begin in Rome two nights, and then so we explore Rome extensively, and then we drive into Tuscany, Volterra, uh, to see the Etruscan world, the ancient Etruscan world, the pre-Roman civilization of the Etruscans. And then we spend time in the Mediterranean Sea, in the Cinque Terre, where we have plenty of free time to enjoy and explore the area and the local food with the pesto and all the other specialties. Mm. And then we end up back into Tuscany, capital of which is Florence, capital mm. of Renaissance. And uh, again, nine days straight, yeah. incredible tour. And there's a good airport in Florence, or you can hop on the train and in two hours you're back in Rome. As we mentioned, you can, you can go south. Um, tell us about the South Italy tour, please. South of Italy is one of my favorite tours, by the way. I also run this one in Sicily, and I love the south myself. I always go south on vacation. Uh, we start in Rome, but we see Rome in a little different way rather than other itineraries. So we diversify the itineraries and then we take a peek into the Adrian Villa, the Emperor Adrian, Roman Emperor Adrian Villa, on the way to the Gargano Peninsula, the tip 
uh, the top of the hill of the boot, you know, the region of Puglia. And that's where we're staying for two nights in the town of Vieste, which I love. And then we peek into Puglia to see Albero Bello, where we have an incredible tasting. We stop in Matera, one of the most ancient settlements, human settlements in the world in Matera. That's also where they filmed the movie, The Passion of Christ, which was an incredible movie and shows Matera in, in full. And then we come to the West Coast, stop in Pestum, to the Greek uh, settlement and temples of Pestum. And then we enjoy the Naples area, Amalfi Coast, Capri, Sorrento, and end up in Naples for the last two nights. Oh, Beautiful. And it's, it's six two night stops in a row. Very comfortable. And here we have one, two, three, four, five two night stops, the best of Tuscany. Yes, best of Tuscany again, one of the largest regions. We go to most of the, the 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 most beautiful areas of Tuscany, even though there's more to exp explore. But when we choose an itinerary, when we design an itinerary together with the with the office team, we we do have to think of mm -hmm. what matters on a tour. So we have to make choices. So you always can yeah. come back to places like Tuscany. This is our choice. So. Valdorcia, Chianti, Florence, Siena, Lucca, uh, Maremma, the west, the, the west, the wild west of Tuscany, Pitigliano, the Etruscan area. So this is a real good taste of Tuscany. And I Deep like deep. when you say you have to make choices because it's a temptation to promise everything in 11 days, but guides know the reality. If you try to do too much, the bus drivers say they call it a pajama tour. Why even get out of your pajamas? You never settle into <laughs> yeah. anything. Um, but what we have is a very reasonable speed and a very um, high expectation of what you'll cover without any sort of chaotic insanity or exhaustion or stress. Um, I love the thought that you guys get together every year, all of your colleagues, and debate the itineraries. Every, every hour of the itinerary you guys talk through after your experience, don't you, with my staff. Of course, yes, yes, it's very important because logistics logistics are incredibly important on a tour. It's it's very easy to make a beautiful tour turn bad if you do the wrong logistics. So it's a it's a big teamwork, you know, the tour yeah. guide, the tour managers, the tour directors, and so on. Absolutely, the My Way tour is what we've been talking about, but this is a kind of tour. We have uh, five or six of these itineraries around Europe and they are less expensive, less regimented, and they are just stripped down. It's just designed to take the efficiency of a tour. You're sharing the bus, you've got the hotels, you've got the guidebook, you've got a member of our staff who serves as your, your guide, but that person just has office hours in the morning and you got free time. And it's basically the bus connections and the hotels and the breakfasts. And uh, this is a wonderful uh, compromise between doing it yourself and taking advantage of the efficiency and economy of bus travel. And then Village Italy is the tour that I took my family on and I just loved it because you go to all sorts of intimate slices of life. It's rural, it's small town, it's, it's uh, agriturismos, it's the culture. And uh, that's just a beautiful tour. And we've uh, got, this is sort of the intense tour, the three great cities, three nights in each city. Uh, it's just a delightful look at the three, three of the greatest cities in all of Europe in 10 days. Of all the 40 tours that we sell, this is the best selling tour because Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world. They love Italy and we know how to do the big cities marvelously with our guides, Venice, Florence, and Rome. All right, I do wanna remind you that we have 20 hours of these kind of presentations archived. If you go to uh, Monday Night Travel, this is, uh, we're doing Monday Night Travel eight nights in a row during our festival. But ever since COVID hit, every Monday we've been offering uh, a party and these are archived. If you go to Rick Steves on the homepage, you'll see Monday Night Travel, you see what's happening next week and the next week and you can sign up. Uh, you can also just go into the archive right there at that same tab and see all the shows we've done over the year. And if you look back one year to January, click on any of those Monday Night Travels and you will see the whole festival, all 22 nights. And there, if you wanted to do uh, Sicily, or if you wanted to do small town Italy, or if you wanted to do big city Italy, you've got entire hours for that that David and I were not able to cover tonight. Uh, so tonight we're doing Italy, tomorrow it's Great Britain, the next is Spain and Portugal, and then France, Germany, Central Europe, and our grand finale next Monday right here. It's a virtual party. I hope you can join us on those. I'm so thankful for our guides. I mean, if you enjoy David, there's 150 passionate guides like David that are colleagues and we're all on the same team together, doing our best to share our love of Europe with you in an efficient and economic way. Hey, um, I think Lisa, it's time to uh, have a few questions. 
Oh, we have so many questions. I'll try and corral them all. Um, the first one's kind of a philosophical and personal question for David. Charlotte would like to know, what keeps you coming back to guiding even after a long day? It's just, it's, to me, it's one of the most beautiful jobs in the world, honestly. It's, uh, it, you get to meet new people every time. You get to share new information and learn more myself. Every time I run a tour, I get to learn from the local guys, from the local people, the vendors. It's just, uh, it's a never-ending loop process for me as long as i can do it i'll be more than happy to do it, it, it i got i gotta jump in and, and and remind uh everybody not everybody can be a guide it's it's a lifestyle you've got to enjoy living on the road you're always on call it's physically very demanding but for the right person and i when i talk to people who are in this business i just know this person was born to be a guide and it's a beautiful thing when that person finds their niche and I think, uh, David, we, we can both think of our, our colleagues uh, and like your enthusiasm for this and my enthusiasm for it. We're blessed to have found our niches and it makes life go easy because we know what we're supposed to do on this planet. Agreed. It's it's like a life lymph, you know, you, you if you don't have it, you miss something. So it's uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it needed. Yeah. Well, and, and you couldn't probably couldn't do it all year long. By the nature of the work, it's it's a half a year, you know, so. You you, yeah. you don't you might burn out if you tried to do it twelve months straight. Correct. Thanks. Yep. Okay, Lisa. All right, for both of you gentlemen, Susan would like to know what's your favorite chapter of Italian history. Huh. Ooh. <laughs> 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 Mamma mia, uh, Rick, you want to go first? Risorgimento. Ah, you like the I, Risorgimento? I like the the Garibaldi, baby. Yeah, Garibaldi. I, I just think you know, in eighteen fifty, Europe was ruled by a bunch of royal fam families and nobody wanted Italy to be independent. They were colonized by the other big powers. And these Italian patriots got together and they were subversive and they've schemed and they plotted and they had the perfect storm of George Washington's and Thomas Jefferson's and Benjamin Franklin's and, and so on. And they got it all together and incredible story. And around 1870, Viva, it, uh, you know, it's Italy is united. It's a great story. That's the Risorgimento. Um, yes. Of course, there's the re Renaissance and ancient Rome and everything, but Risorgimento is underrated. Yeah, it's a great moment of history. Actually, as a matter of fact, I've been learning more and more about the Risorgimento, the unification process of my country, which is a great moment in our history. I also love the moment of our history that predates the Romans. So to learn more about the ancient pre-Roman civilizations like the Etruscans, the the area where I come from was populated by the Etruscans, but not only the Etruscans, all the other civilizations that somehow brought a lot more than we think into mm. the, the new, let's call it new Roman world that forged the Western world yeah. that we live in today. So, And a lot of people would, would claim that some of the most interesting Greek temples, ancient Greek temples, are in Italy because Italy was a Greek colony. Correct. Southern Italy was a Greek colony and was never unfortunately devastated by the wars uh, or the Ottoman Empire conquest, like it happened in, in some areas of Greece wow. and Turkey, of course, uh, while Southern Italy, Sicily, and Southern Italy was never touched by the Ottomans. And that's why you go to Agrigento, Sicily, or Pestum near Naples, south of Naples, and you find amazing temples, but not only temples, even the art, other parts of architecture in the museums, you find incredible findings. So I'm paying attention. I just want to tie my scarf like you do. Okay. Bravo. Yes. Why Sorry, don't we know more about the Etruscans or why don't we hear more about the Etruscans? Because um, may I answer this one, Rick? Please. Okay. Because, um, you know, when, when Rome became Rome for like a thousand years, 500 BC to 500 AD, give or take, if you like dates, it's 476 AD, BC to 453, uh, 453, sorry, 753 BC to 476 AD, sorry. But anyway, for a thousand years, Rome Romanized the Western world, conquered everything they needed to conquer throughout the Mediterranean. So all the pre-existing civilizations were absorbed, not destroyed, always destroyed like we all think the Romans arrived and destroyed. No, that's that those are rare cases. Most of all, they were absorbed by the Roman and became and, and got Romanized. I use this word with my tour members, Romanized for so long that mm. we lost track of them. And they became Romans. The Etruscans became Romans. The Umbrians became Romans. The Ligurians became Romans. The Iberian people became Romans. So for so long, 
we lost track. And with new technology, archaeology, we are able to start slowly but surely finding traces back and learn more about them. But that's why we call them mysterious. They're not mysterious. They were not mysterious. They were there before the Romans, but they were absorbed. You have a necropolis, an Etruscan necropolis, about a five, 10 minute walk down the cliff from your house. Correct. And it's it's a never-ending digging process. Every oh, every amazing. week I meet my friend, the, the local archaeologist who's in charge of the diggings, and he said, yeah, we need more people. We need volunteers. We, need, we, we know there's a 2,000 tombs right there under that uh, beautiful hill, but we got to remove the owner of the olive grove and the vineyard on top first to dig, and it's impossible. So, But we know what's there. It, Rick says it, no. No digging up the vineyards. No, I, <laughs> no, I know. I'm, I'm, I want to drink. I want to drink to the archaeologists who are out there digging it up for yeah. us. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, what happens is that the archaeologist often tries to convince the landowner, and they get together for lunch and they drink wine. So yeah. the archaeologist forgets about the diggings, and the owner is happy and sends the archaeology the archaeologist away. Hey, that's the <laughs> Italian way. What's another question, Lisa? Well, David, I grew up knowing or thinking that I knew that Italians vacationed either in the mountains or the beaches. Is that still true? And where did you go as a child? Uh, as a child, we, my parents uh, used to rent a, a beach house for the whole family, and we would go to the beach mainly. Uh, later, when in my in my young 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 years, like in my twenties, I liked to go hiking in the mountains, but not really in the winter. And, uh, and I've always liked to travel uh, the world and see other countries, capitals, continents, and so on. Um, so Italians now are more, are better travelers than they used to be. Italians started to travel later because first they were traveling by immigration reasons. You know, people had to migrate and uh, those who stayed, stayed, didn't really have a luxury to travel, but traveling is also a luxury. And now Italians are wealthier than ever before and so now they extended their um their horizons you know so i thought italians didn't leave the country because they were worried about the food not being as good as back home that's so it took me a long time to convince <laughs> my parents to leave italy i i i confirm, <laughs> I confirm that i just have a tough time in italian restaurants in the united states they can be excellent but there's just something not there and it's it's not just the quality of the food it's the it's the commotion and the ambiance that you love when you're in Italy. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. The garlic in Italian ah, America. The garlic. The go. garlic. Everywhere you go, Italian American restaurant, you open the door, it's like, <gasps> it's a lot of garlic in your face. We don't use that much garlic here at all. Wow. Good, good insight. Okay, Lisa. So a lot of the people in the Q&A are asking about tours and what do we do with the bus time on our tours? What are we, how are we utilizing that time on the bus? I personally love that we can give some concise talks on the bus that are relevant to the group, like cultural talks, or often I share with my, my tour members personal insights of my life, my family, my local culture, but we don't talk all the time. We leave people free to nap, relax, read a book, see the uh, sightseeing. Um, and we also take uh, what we call rest stops at very nice local areas where we can use of course use the bathrooms but also have a nice coffee cappuccino croissant and which is not croissant it's called cornetto i eh? don't don't let's not get mistaken <laughs> cornetto no. is italian croissant is french they're both amazing but they're different but anyway it is apart, interesting yeah. but it is interesting by the way that a rest stop a freeway rest stop with a restaurant has to have a decent restaurant it's not going to be a fancy restaurant but it's got to be good or the bus drivers won't stop there you know it's quality you can get a good lunch at a freeway yes. restaurant in italy better than other places that's the absolute truth all right this one is for both of you or maybe specifically rick allison wants to know what are your thoughts on travel boycotts should we avoid traveling somewhere if we disagree with our government that's she's wanted, uh, travel is a political act yeah um you know i i think a boycott doesn't really accomplish as much as going there and learning about the problem and having people get to know you. When we travel, we get to know people that a lot of cases are supposed to be our enemies and they get to know us and it makes it tougher for their propaganda to demonize us and it makes it tougher for our propaganda to minimize them. And we also gain an empathy for each other. So I just feel like people to people travel and that's a, that's a difference than just travel but 
travel where you honestly meet people. If there's a wall, you get to talk to people on both sides of it. If there's a boycott, you get to understand who's, what are, this, what are the cases, what are the sides? That's the most constructive thing. So I cannot remember a boycott from a travel point of view that I would embrace. I always think it's better to go there and meet people. I've had a lot of people that would say, don't go to that place because I don't like their government. You know, they might be anti this or anti that. And I don't like the fact that they're anti this and anti that, but I don't like the fact that we're not talking to each other more. I agree. Uh, what does that make agree. sense? That's good, David. Yeah. No, nothing to add. Completely agree. Yeah. Always right, get to the place to learn. Yeah. Last question, gentlemen. Um, you did not reveal where you went as a child. We're looking for we're looking for off the beaten path places. So the question is for you: Is what town did you go to at the beach when you were a kid? And Rick, are there any up and coming places in Italy that you want to share with us? Okay, so, David. I'll give you. Should I go first, Rick? Yeah. Or you please okay. you go first, yeah. So the town that we we went for many years when we were kids is called Montalto di Castro, Montalto Marina, which is the closest town uh, as the crow flies from my town of Vieto. An hour drive and you're at the beach. But there's also beautiful towns north of there into southern Tuscany, which are called Capalbio and Ansedonia, beautiful beaches, great restaurants, and then the Tuscan coastline is beautiful and it has it all. So anywhere on the Tus on the Tuscan coastline and south of it is perfect. That's Thank you, David. Where... And my takeaway from David's answer is it's a reminder that if you're complaining about the crowds in Italy, you're going to all the places that the Americans go. And uh, the Italians are not going to go there and stand in line and pay triple for their gelato. They're going to go to those kind of places that David just mentioned. And it's a reminder, there's huge depth in what we can see and experience in any country. And of course, we want to see the Leaning Tower and the Eiffel Tower and Big Ben, but there's so much more. And you can take away the most crowded places all across Europe and still have plenty of wonderful places to go on your vacation if you'd rather see locals and spend half the money than to hang out with other Americans and spend double. Uh, so it's, a, it's just a, a positive kind of approach to, to crowds. Hey, uh, my, my answer to your question, Lisa, what's, what am I thinking in the future? What are hot new uh, opening ups or something like that? I'm really pretty satisfied with our itineraries. We have more than 40 itineraries. I love where we go. I am more committed to making sure we can do these itineraries in the smartest way for our travelers. For me, the challenge is to be sure we have good bus drivers, great hotels, great restaurants, great connections with the artisans, and most importantly, we take good care of our guides and our guides take good care of our travelers. Um, to take 30,000 people around Europe every year on 40 different itineraries with 150 guides, 1,200 departures, to do that in a way that's a good value and we can pay our staff well and our guides well and we can still be profitable it's a wonderful challenge from an entrepreneurial point of view, and we're loving it, and we're determined to um, offer Americans the best value going if it comes to taking a boutique tour around Europe, and we hope you can join our guides like David Tordy. Hey, David, thank you so much for getting up in the middle of your night and having some coffee correcto. One more drink to you, my friend, and I hope you can get back to sleep with your grappa. Salute. <laughs> so you're done with the coffee now, you're into the grappa. No, the coffee is gone. The coffee All is right. Gone. Now I'm after the, the, the grappa is called the coffee killer. You know, you have coffee and then you kill it with the grappa and you try to go to bed. Well, I think you'll manage fine. I want to thank Gabe and Keith who are in the trenches answering all the questions behind the scenes and Lisa for moderating this evening and all of you for joining us. And David, once again, thanks a lot. Happy travels to everybody. And thanks for being here. We'll see you soon, I hope. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. We love feedback. So there's a survey at the end of this. If you'd like to join us, we appreciate it. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Buonanotte, David. Buonanotte, Rick. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Ciao, Rick. Ciao, David. Thank you. Great job, David. See you down the road.